we are kind of entering into a new phase of the Christian year. The uh, early Christians, even before, uh, uh, goes way, way back, uh, realized that there were some significant and important events in the life of the church that they wanted us to focus on. And so the church uh, kind of goes with a, a cycle, if you will. Um, I think I might have a thing up here. And just bec because so many of you are asking about this, I thought I would go over this. Uh, actually, nobody asked about it, but, uh, uh, but I wanted to share it anyway. You may not be able to see that, but it kind of gives you the picture of what... Not everybody's been a Methodist all their life, and even some Methodists don't understand this. Uh, so just a real quick Sunday school lesson on the church calendar. And uh, if you'll notice, <clears throat> at the top in the purple, and the colors correspond to the colors. So you'll notice today the colors are white. That's the color it's supposed to be, if you'll notice, because we are in Transfiguration Sunday. So the seasons, there's basically five major seasons. You know, you, have, you start out with Advent. And Advent is leading up to Christmas. And so Advent and Christmas are not the same. Advent is a preparation for Christmas. And uh, you, then you have your season of Lent, Easter, Pentecost, uh, and so forth. But the, then you see some other little times. So the Advent, several weeks, then you have the season, then Christmas. And then after Christmas, it's called the season after Epiphany, because this begins on Epiphany Sunday when the wise men saw the star and they began to follow Jesus, to find the baby Jesus, the child Jesus. And after that, it's called, it's not really exactly a season, but we call it a season after Epiphany, because Epiphany is a standalone. There are some standalone Sundays that are not really a whole season, but one, one Sunday. And so it's called season after Epiphany, and some people, there's ordinary season, they call it ordinary. So uh, that's where we've been. We've been in the season after Epiphany. Uh, and now today we have the standalone Sunday, the Transfiguration Sunday. Apparently somebody thought it was important enough to actually make it a Sunday all, of it, all on its own. And we'll talk more about that. Then we're interested, you know, Transfiguration is sort of stepping stone from the season of Epiphany into the season of Lent. So this coming Wednesday night, we will have the Ash Wednesday service where we will do the imposition of the ashes. And I encourage everybody to come, even if you're not able to normally come on Wednesday nights, if you can work out your schedule to be here. Uh, it's an important event. It begins a 40-day uh, season of just prayer, fasting, and those things, where we get uh, connected with God in, in a different way. Uh, and so we'll start that this, this Wednesday night. And then, you know, you have the Holy Week, uh, the leading up to Easter, and then Easter is a standalone service. And then you have the season after Easter. So everything after that, uh, we'll say the first Sunday after Easter, the second Sunday after Easter, and so forth. And then, uh, I don't know if y'all can see this right here, but I think that's Pentecost, that little red one. Uh, it's a standalone Sunday, so representing the day, uh, you know, the Pentecost Sunday. And then Trinity Sunday, where we look at the uh, Holy Trinity, Trinity, and then the season after Pentecost, uh, may, some people may call it ordinary Sunday, uh, ordinary time, uh, but it's just a time, it's green, and you'll know we have a little break there with All Saints, uh, All Saints Sunday, and then following that is the Reign of Christ Sunday, and then we start all over with the season of Advent. So I wanted to show you those just to so you kind of have an idea of what's, why we do what we do. Now I, some of you didn't and I did not grow up in a Methodist church. I grew up in a Baptist church and when I say Baptist I mean they were real, real Baptist. And what I mean by that is uh, that we, we did not uh, recognize different seasons of the church calendar. Uh, the Christian calendar. We simply uh, recognize certain days like Christmas and those kind of things. But for the most part, we follow the uh, secular calendar. 
And so these times were not that big a deal uh, growing up. I didn't understand them. And when I first became a, a Methodist, uh, I, I, I want you to know that I didn't appreciate it as much as I do now. The longer I've been in the Methodist Church, the more I've come to appreciate the seasons and the cycle of the seasons. Because it's a time, that reminder, we are so busy. We are so busy in our world. Our, our lives are so chaotic sometimes. Not everybody, but many of us are busy. And our lives are so chaotic that we need reminders sometimes. We need a season or a special Sunday to remind us, wait a minute, let's stop and recognize that this is an important event in the life of the church. And so today, I said all that to say this, that we have come to a Sunday, kind of an in-between Sunday, but do not minimize its importance. What's called the Sunday, the Mount of Transfiguration Sunday. And in this passage that was read, uh, you, can, you can follow along with us if, if you like, with, if you're writing notes. Uh, I want to I mention the first point here, and, and William should put this on the screen, and that is following Jesus can be a wonderful experience. Following Jesus can be a wonderful experience. I mean, after all, they got to see something that only a few on this uh, odd little mystical moment when they go up on this mountain and all of a sudden the angels sort of peel the veil from Jesus. And all of a sudden they get just a glimpse of God's glory. It must have been an amazing, wonderful time. And it was so good that Peter said, it's good for us to be here. Let's make some dwellings and let's just hang out like Johnny says. We just want to stay here. Have you ever been in a place that was so wonderful that you just didn't want to leave? A moment in time that you just didn't want to end? That's exactly what they were experiencing. This is just so good. Peter says, it's good for us to be here. And I want to tell you that in the Christian life, there are going to be those times when it is so, so good that you don't want it to end. And you know, every day there's moments like that because all around us are beautiful colors. And I, this season begins. We're just kind of starting into the, getting into the close to the springtime and the sun begins to shine and the, all of a sudden the flowers begin to bloom and the grass begins to grow uh, and the colors change. And they remind us of the beauty of God. And each of these moments can be wonderful moments in the Christian life. I'm thankful for these times because it's moments like these that get us through the tough times of life. I'm thankful for the times where we can enjoy the beauty of God and the wonder of God. And I hope we never lose that, the mystical part of God where we try to just enjoy the mystery of God. And, and it's a beautiful thing. And life has some great moments. And I think back in, in life and some of those times in our lives where we've seen God move in marvelous ways. And maybe just a moment we got a glimpse of the glory of God. And maybe we got to experience something that not everybody gets to experience. And it's something that you can't even explain if you try to explain it. Because have you ever been through a, a, a really wonderful time? I think about uh, the time like the Asbury Revival. And then you try to explain it to somebody who's not experienced. Or maybe, Michelle, your experience with the, uh, you know, the upper room uh, when you talk about going to a walk to Emmaus. When you try to explain your experience and your emotions to someone else and you look at them and you realize they're just not getting it. I bet you that's something like what happened here. When they come down off of that mountain and they tried to tell everybody what happened, I'm sure there were people that looked at them like they were crazy. Kind of like today. We think, well, we, you know, we live in a day when... We don't talk about mystical moments and we don't talk about mi miraculous things too much. But yet sometimes God moves in such a way 
that we just want to talk about it and it's sometimes very disturbing when we try to share our hearts with somebody else and they just don't seem to get it or don't seem to care and for whatever reason people can't always absorb that because it has to be experience and that's why Peter said it's good for us to be here I just want to I just want to make some dwellings and and here's Moses and Elijah showing up you know uh, out of the, out of the blue you know these Old Testament characters I mean what an event it must have been so following Jesus can be a wonderful experience but I want to say number two that following Jesus can be a frightful and confusing experience the disciples were not exactly jumping up for and down for joy at this point the Bible says that they were basically basically they were scared to death and you know that reminds us that God sometimes leads us to steel waters but there are times where he leads us to turbulent waters as well where when we follow the Lord we don't always know what to expect we like things to stay the same and we like to know what to expect but we all know that life isn't that way that life hands us sometimes some lemons and sometimes some things worse than that and so we can't always know what to expect and I'm sure that the disciples at this point does not know what is going to happen and there is a moment of terror here I spent years in Bible college and seminary and uh, you know eight ten years in that and then several other years in Christian education and chaplain school trying to understand all about it God and there was a time when I when I thought I did understand when I thought I had all the answers and and uh, you know I, I came out of there thinking well I've got it all figured out and I think I've got God figured out too and the older I got the more I realized I don't have the answers because all the answers that I have didn't work sometimes in certain situations and didn't make sense and I began to realize that God is a mystery and much of life is a mystery as well as we begin to try to understand the nature of God, it's not that we shouldn't try to figure God out or try to have thoughts about God, but understanding that God is a mystery and we learn sometimes to live into that mystery. I've been reading a book that's called The Sin of Certainty, Peter Ends, and it models kind of an acceptance of mystery and paradox to say that there's a lot of things that is paradoxical, and I've, I've believed this for a long time, about God and the nature of God and even things in the Bible. Um, some people will hold on to their beliefs even when they, when they know that they don't when they're not true just simply because that's what their church says for you to believe I I used to say this all the time and one of my favorite sayings used to be know what you believe and why you believe it and I still think that you ought to try to understand as much as you can but now I don't say that as much anymore because I believe that we need to understand that we have to live into the mystery of God to know that there's some things that we can't figure out about God because he is a mystery that uh, sometimes that we need to realize that God is God and he may not do what we think he should do even you know we read the Bible and, and I, get, I, I see this all the time where people think that God's going to do this because they read they read somewhere in the passage of the Bible that God said he would do this and then he does just the opposite and their faith is crushed it seems like you know uh, you, you read in one place and it's and it says you know uh, I, the moon the sun shall not smite thee by day or the moon by night and nothing's going to happen to you and God's will is that you prosper and all that and you say oh there it is there it is and you read in Psalms where he says that, that the righteous shall prosper and so you hold on to that and there's a lot of people out there a lot of uh, prosperity gospel preachers that will tell you exactly that and sometimes that's very true and a lot of the Bible people believed exactly that. They believed if you dotted all the I's and crossed the T's and you did everything just right, that everything would go according to plan. 
But the book of Job just blows all that out of the water. And here is a man, of, the Bible says he was upright and he did all the right things and he, he done everything he knew he was supposed to do and trouble, trouble, trouble happened anyway. And it was his friends that said, Job, you've done something wrong. And Job said, no, I didn't. And they said, yes, you did. And so the first seven days, there's, there's silence. And then after that, they begin to talk. And, you know, understand that they did what they thought they, the Bible taught. Just like a lot of people today. They, they read it somewhere in the Bible, and, and therefore it's got to be. And he's like, Job, you had to have sinned because this bad thing has happened to you. And Job's like, I didn't do anything wrong. You're, they go back and forth for the next uh, so many chapters. There's just a back and forth dialogue about you did something wrong, Job. And Job's, no, I didn't. I didn't do anything wrong. Yes, you did. No, I didn't. Yes, you did. No, I didn't. Well, you had to have sinned. Well, I didn't sin. Yes, you did. And finally, God comes on the scene and God speaks to Job and to these fellows. And he basically tells them they're wrong. But God doesn't even give an explanation for what happened. In the end, of the, by the time you get to the book of Job's ending, guess what? You still don't have an answer. You know, God could have just said to Job, Job, there's some things going on behind the scenes that you don't understand. You see, I had a, I had a talk with this, the accuser, uh, and, and, you know, this is kind of a deal that's going on, and you, you just don't worry about it. But God didn't even tell Job that. Which says to me, but sometimes when we think we have all the answers that, you know, we don't really have all the answers. And, and part of the problem is this. The Bible was written by over 40 different authors over thousands of years apart. And these authors wrote what they were feeling at the time. And they wrote exactly what they thought at the time. And they spoke to different people at different times. And there were times when people needed to hear Something, a word from the Lord that wasn't for all time, but it was for that time. And there were other times when they needed to hear something else, a completely different message. And so that's why you can read in one passage and it seems to say one thing and another and it says a different. Because at times we need a different message. There's times where God says, uh, you know, not to doubt and not to waver. And then there's times where God says, live into the mystery so what I'm saying is that we have to take it all in, together. We can't take one passage here, one passage there. We have to take the whole counsel of God. And even then, there's a mystery of God. This is what, uh, I've got a quote here, it uh, should be on the screen. Uh, Peter Enns uh, says, A faith like that is stressful and tedious to maintain. Moving toward different ways of thinking, even just trying it out or trying it on for a while to see how it fits, is perceived as a compromise to faith or as giving up on faith altogether. But nothing could be further from the truth. So in summary, this, this the sin of certainty is really about letting go of the need to always have the answers and to always know that, you know, being theologically correct and having all the answers and knowing You've got God figured out. The older I get, and I hopefully the more mature I get, I've learned to let go. And just let God be God. And let God figure it all out. We had a lady in the hospital once who was of the mindset of what I would call the prosperity gospel that says if you just believe it, you'll receive it. Name it and claim it. And she had a son who was at death's door. And no matter what anyone said, she was not going to listen to anybody else. And the son was already uh, turning uh, jaundice. And I am one who believes that God can and do great things. And I've seen God heal and I've, got, I've seen God do miracles. And I do not want to discount that at all. But at the same time, to me, real faith, to me, real faith is not saying that God's going to do exactly what I think he should at this point because I read it somewhere in the Bible. But to me, real faith is saying, God, I believe that you're able to do this. 
But even if you don't do exactly what I think you should, I'm still going to trust you. Now, that's a hard place to get to, maybe. But that's faith. And I want you to know this particular lady would not ever have any kind of, she didn't want anybody uh, having any kind of doubt or uh, telling her any kind of reality about this person's condition. Therefore, she had him transferred to a different hospital where he died anyway. And what I'm saying is today is we live in a world of realities and we don't know what tomorrow holds. But we got to trust in the God who holds tomorrow. You know, we talked about the fact that Paul said, I determined not to know anything among them except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. There are some things that we can cling to. And that's one of them. You know, he didn't say, I determined not to know anything except the book of discipline. I didn't, he didn't say, I determined not to know anything except what the United Methodist tells us to know. Or what the Baptist tells us to know. He said, I didn't determine not to know anything among them except Jesus. And then another place he says, that I might know Him. Not it, but Him. We talked about last Sunday some symptoms of spiritual immaturity, which included having the blinding certainty that your understanding of faith is right, and therefore anyone else who sees faith differently must be wrong. That's a sign of spiritual immaturity. We did a study on Wednesday nights not long ago. We talked about different denominations in different churches. And what we found was that while there are some areas that we disagree with, there are a whole lot of areas that we do agree on and that we can learn from each other. And I used to be one of those that, would, that didn't want to talk to anybody who didn't believe like I believed. But now I'm, I'm, I'm not so much like that anymore. I want to hear other people's opinions. And I may, at the end of it, say to you, well, we're going to have to agree to disagree. But I still value what you what your opinion is the problem is we all see through a glass darkly Paul said but then face to face so what do we do when we encounter these times of that are confusing and frightening or wonderful whatever what do we do well this is our last point that we'll put up here I think um, in those times when we experience joy or are filled with fear we should listen to him. That's in verses 5 through 9. I'm not sure if we have, yeah, I don't think we have it. Listen to him. That's what he said. When their voice from heaven came, almost like at his baptism, and they began to, you know, to talk about what we're going to do, the voice said, This is my beloved son. Listen to him. Hear him. He's the one. He's the voice in the darkness when you don't understand. While he was still speaking, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. And a stranger they not, will not follow. Why is that? Because they listen to the voice. They learn the voice of the master, of the shepherd. And they know the voice and they follow that voice. So what do you do when you're confused? What do you do when you're in a situation where everything seems dark? You follow the voice. You just listen to God. You won't be led astray if you're listening to God. There's a lot of voices out there. But you know the voice of the Master. You do. Uh, we also mentioned last week that some symptoms of spiritual growth include understanding that faith is neither a guarantee of prosperity nor protection from troubles, but a certain knowledge that God is with you. What did David say? Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil, for thou art with me. I went to a meeting the other night. Um, that was a mandatory meeting for clergy. Most of you know, you've heard on the news by now that uh, there's a pro what they call a protocol that's been presented. Uh, and both sides 
of those that we would consider traditionalists and progressives have come to the realization that there are irreconcilable difference. And so basically, it's similar to a divorce. They come to the place where they realize we fought long enough and we can't do what we did back at the last general conference. And this fighting and arguing has gone on long enough. And so, we're going to agree to disagree and we're going to go our separate ways. And so in 2020 of May of this year, the General Conference, and by the way, the General Conference is the only one that can speak for the Methodist Church. The Annual Conference, not so much. The General Conference can change uh, the Book of Discipline that is our rule book, whatever. That's going to happen at this year at the General Conference in May. I want us to begin praying for the General Conference. And so uh, we were invited, or actually not invited, we were uh, told that we need to go to a meeting, which was a mandatory meeting in uh, Prestonburg uh, this past week. And so I went down there, spent a couple hours, and uh, guess what I learned? <laughs> really nothing that I don't already have, know. And uh, all I'm saying is I didn't learn much because there's not much they can tell you right now. We're in uncertain times. We are uh, in a time where we don't know until general conference happens. And so some people have already jumped ship and left uh, the Methodist church. Uh, some big churches have left the Methodist church for various reasons. I pastored a little church in Bethel um, right outside in Bath County. And uh, they, they had pulled out. So I think, though I think that's premature because I don't know and none of us know what what it's going to look like down the road. The proposals that being presented has to be voted on and they may not even uh, it may not even change but it's looking like uh, the Methodist Church as we know it will look a little different in a couple years and it'll take some time for that to change. What that will look like we don't know but it'll probably look different. So what do we do? We listen to him. We follow the voice. And we know that God will never lead us astray. If we'll listen to the voice of Jesus, and not all these other voices that we hear, then we'll do the right thing. And that's all, I'm, that's all I believe that we need to do, is just like he says, listen to Him. Trust and obey, for there's no other way. There's been times in my life when I didn't know what to do. When I faced the darkness, and the only thing that got me through was knowing that God, God knew what was best. And even when I doubted, He still knew what was best. So I want to invite you to do that today as we listen to the voice of Christ. I want to ask the musicians to come up today. As we get ready to sing a song, the invitation is open for all those who would like to come and pray. And I want you to know today that no matter what happens, God is still God. God doesn't depend upon any denomination. And regardless of what the name over the door is or will be, Jesus still is calling us to Him. And so let's listen to Him. <laughs> 